Okay, welcome to the September 23rd Propeller 2 live event. Um, we only have uh, some news about the P2 EC Rev Cs. We were able to finish making some keychains out of the fail boards, and they are actually shipping out uh, right now with orders. Sadly, that's limited to domestic shipping. I have set some aside for some of you guys because most of you are outside the country. So uh, before you start screaming, I, I have some set aside. <laughs> uh, but due to customs, uh, we cannot send them in any order, you know, without changing invoices, it gets uh, messy. And um, with that being said, we are good for the presentation. Uh, so how do you, how we should name you? Is that uh, Coley is your last name, right? Graham or Coley? <laughs> Actually, my name's, my second name is Cole, but everybody calls me Coley. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a common thing over here in the UK. People either shorten your second name or add a Y. Or add so my S. name is Aristides. So I was Aristides in Argentina <laughs> all my life until I show up at Parallax at, can look at me and say, ah, that's not going to work. So Ari, Ari, welcome to Parallax. Uh, that was 20 years ago. So, <laughs> so I go by Ari now too. So yeah, I know how that works. <laughs> so um, after the arcade machine presentation, we'll have an update from Chip on the floating point, uh, but that will be after. So um, Coley, if you want, I can stop sharing my screen so you can share, or, or at least we can see you in bigger in the screen. Yeah, if you can just make me full screen, I've got a... Uh... There you are. Okay, right. So um, if I switch to my second camera, you should see two of the cabinets up and running. Yeah. So um, what I wanted to do, I'll just switch back to the main camera. Just first of all, just go through a bit of the uh, construction techniques I've used. So the whole cabinet is made out of three millimeter uh, plywood, which I've got, I've cut on my laser cutter. Um, it's proven to be quite challenging to get consistency and everything else. Um, so if I just show you my, the SketchUp model to start with, um, this is the six button version. This, this is the, what we're, what we're referring to as the standalone version. So, um, the, the, the two cabinets that I'll show you tonight are the single button version. That's for the 18 one, which is the um, eight separate cabinets connected to one um, central processing unit, one P2 edge. But this is the next version. This is the version that I'm working on now. Um, this is the six button version that will, hand, that will house a standalone, either a P2 or whatever you want, really. Um, it's going to be uh, some IO, and a screen and some speakers. And if I just get rid of, um, in fact, this is this is one good thing that Roger Lowe on the on the forum suggested that we should have a rotatable screen. So this is one of the changes that I made for the latest cabinets. And this is where the screen can come out. Can, it's held on by neodymium magnets. Can rotate round, <clears throat> and you can have it have it in portrait mode, mode or landscape mode. That's worked out really well. Um, the, the, the magnets are just strong enough to keep it in place, but not too strong that you can't take it out. Um, cool. I just want to go through the construction of this now and just show you really how all the pieces are put together. There's 24 component parts go into this, this cabinet. And I'll, 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 what I'll do is I'll, I'll hide all the different bits. So what we've got on the outside of each cabinet is a, is a blank um piece so the blank is on that side it's not on that side and that hides all of the joints and everything so ultimately what happens is the the the, the all the pieces are pushed together and then then the final bit is to glue it glue the the side pieces on and that holds everything so if i just uh, get rid of this one as well so if i hide that and this is what's inside so plenty of room to put uh, any processing device behind here. Um, the, there is a set of speakers up at the top. So that's the, uh, the marquee uh, piece of uh, clear uh, perspex or acrylic. Uh, we've got a couple of speakers. 
the just four watt or or uh, sorry four ohm or eight ohm. We've got the actual screen assembly, and once I've hidden the screen assembly, you can see there the back frame, which has also got neodymium magnets on there, which is what holds everything in place. We've got the joystick assembly at the front. If I just get rid of all the joystick buttons, hide those, get rid of the joystick, hide that as well. So this is another one that's in two pieces. And this, this was really was part of the challenge uh, of putting this, this, this whole thing together is where we got two pieces together, getting the consistency of putting two pieces together and gluing them together so that they became one. Because what we've had to do is just the construction of the, the joystick. We've had to hide screws and so on and so forth. So if I just hide that one, you'll see now that there's mounting holes for the joystick. So though these four holes here screw down into the base of the joystick. And then the other piece, if I just put that back on, that gets glued to the top and hides all the, all the, uh, all the fixings. So what you get from the whole cabinet is there's not one fixing seen anywhere, except on the rear, uh, on, on the lid at the back and, and underneath. So that's um, pretty much the cab. If I switch back to my second camera. You should see, we've got two cabinets up and running now. Um, I'll just quickly show you what we've got here. So we've got uh, the P2 Edge module in the P2 Arcade uh, breakout board. We've got eight different breakouts for each of the one of the eight cabs and the cab is just um, a screen some buttons and some sound so if I unplug it plug it back in I can choose any one of the 9 10 11 12 games that we've got on there so I'll start a game that's Space Invaders. I'll go down to the other cab, choose Lunar Rescue. Both running independently on separate cores within the uh, within the propeller two. So, and as I said, this is just literally the Cat Five cable. This is the uh, almost the finished unit. Just hasn't got the sides on yet. It's it's important to note that these are not yet glued together the uh, the quality on the laser is such that it's literally a press fit now notice that i've plugged that back in it's gone straight back to the thing to the uh, to the arcade rom that was running because as i said earlier this is literally just a screen an amplifier some speakers and some io so this is using the the io is is done by chips um, ADC, um, which is reading five different resistor values. I think we start off at uh, 1.2K, 600 ohms, 300, 150 and 75. Gives us five different states. So we've got up, down, left, right and fire. So that means we have to be a little bit creative in terms of... Um, um, sorry, I'll just, I'll just stop that. Hey, Graham. Anytime. Yeah? So <clears throat> what, what Graham's saying is that this whole cabinet is being supported off of three I.O. pins. There's one I.O. pin that's driving the composite baseband video, which you see there. There's one pin uh, per cabinet, which is uh, hooked to five different push buttons, which can all be read simultaneously. And then there's one pin per cabinet that uh, has the audio program. So three pins, video, audio, and button inputs. So this screen is actually completely passive. It's not making any decisions. It just has uh, three pins from the P2 chip going to it uh, with some power, with some 12 volts and ground to hook everything together. But there's no processing in here. It's all being done on, on the related cog of the P2 over three IOs. Yeah, so just to uh, describe that in more detail, I don't know if it's very clear, uh, but we've got, um, 
a class D audio amplifier. We've got the electronics that run the, the screen. And then we've just got a breakout there for all of the uh, connectors for all the different things. Um, and then a Cat5 cable that just breaks out to this socket at the back. So we're using um, different strands of the, um, of the Cat5 to deliver power ground. So the power is 12 volts. Um, with, the, um, with the screen running and the lights on and the sound going, it, it averages about 355 milliamps at 12 volts, peaks up to about 800 when the sounds get really loud. Um, I was a bit worried about having the potential for 10 amps coming through uh, a Cat5 cable. So each of the cabinets has got a fuse in it about 1.2 amps. Um, those are really the only changes I made. When, we, when, when Chip designed this board originally, when Michael did, sorry, we had a breakout board like this, um, which has got the buttons on to do left, right, up, down and fire. It's got breakouts for video, audio, um, that's combined video and audio, 12 volts power, and of course the Cat5 cable in. This is great for a desktop environment when you want to connect it to a TV and everything else, but it was very, very difficult to incorporate into the cabinet. So I just did a little breakout board, which literally just breaks out the Cat5, puts the resistors on for all the, uh, for all the IO, and then just breaks out 12 volts video and audio just into little JST connectors. They seem to be the easiest thing to do and it makes assembly of the cabinet that much easier. There's no soldering involved now once, once all the bits are made. Um, I'll just switch back to my main screen. Okay, so what I was saying before about the challenges that I had putting this together um, was getting the um, the two pieces, the, the parts that were made of two pieces to stick together uh, consistently. So I ended up making a jig. So this is the outer bit here is, is again two pieces and this is the, the screen, part of the front of the screen assembly. And I would put the two pieces in there. And we've got some captive screws, which are just glued in. We've got some press fit neodymium magnets, which hold it onto the frame. And apply the glue, clamp it all up, and once it's dried, pop it out, and there we have, we've got our screen assembly. From there, it's pop the screen in. Again, it's just a press fit. We have the carrier board for the back. And then just some simple wing nuts. And that is a self-contained screen assembly then. I've actually put the screen in upside down, as you can see. Um, but what that allows me to do is, is, is take the screen in and out quite easily. I'll demonstrate that again. Now, at the moment, I've, I've nothing to pull it from the front, so I have to push from the back. There you go. So when we've got a, a, a landscape type game, it plays just as well. Now, one of the really good things that Jim has done uh, on the menu system is allowed us to be able to go back into the main menu. We press uh, down, right, and hold the fire button for three or four seconds. And that allows us to go into the menu system. It also allows us to snoop on what other players are doing. So if I press the right arrow, so player, get, player zero, game zero is in the menu. Player one is playing Space Invaders. So if I play Space Invaders now on the right-hand cab, you'll see everything is reflected on the left-hand cab. And at any time, I can go back to the main menu, choose another game. And all the time, it is reflected on the left-hand cab. 
Jim's also done, which is very good. He's got some two player games. So we've got a tank game. So we're saying, is it this tank game on the right hand cab is in the, in the lobby? Let's wait for another player coming in. There you go. Press fire to play. And now you've got two player cooperative. And that can be done across any of the eight cabs. And we've got two types of games in there light cycles. There you go. Simple as that. That's a little bit of overview on the software. Um, the joysticks themselves. Coley. Yeah. While, while you're still on there, put one game on the left one, like Space Invaders, and put Lunar Rescue on the right one. Yep. And then swap the cat cables at the back. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'll swap them over on the... Oh, yeah, swap them over on the thing. It'd be easier. Now you've got spaces on the left and Moonlander on the right. Just yeah. proves that it is all off the air. Uh... Yeah, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just um, progressively plug um, this cab into um, other sockets and then we'll be able to view from the left-hand cab what we're all playing. So what I'm doing here is going through each one and I'm choosing a different game on each socket, on each cog. And then I'll browse. So you've got two cabinets built so far. Sorry? You've got two cabinets built so far. Um, I've got everything cut out. Um, I only assembled this cabinet today. Um, once all the bits are done once i've created all the cables and everything else putting a cabinet together takes about an hour i just literally i don't have the room for eight cabinets uh, in my workshop so hence i've only done two um let's just it would, it would be fun to see just you know can that motherboard handle all the power to all those different cabinets well that's the only i was just fully enough talking to jim about this before it's, it's the only thing that is is a, 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 a perhaps a little bit of concern is you know 10 amps of potential going through that one circuit board right. um if if need be i'll beef up the um the power distribution on the back of the board chip that's probably the best thing to do in terms of the cat 5 cables themselves they're, they're easily capable of taking that that level of current i think it's 24 awg um so at 12 volts can carry quite a bit of current so no 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 problems there the cabinets themselves have a, um, a fuse in them, so we're not going to get any nasty shorts or anything. You know, that's one of the considerations that, considerations I had to make. Um, Jim's going to show this at a upcoming retro computer show, and members of the public will be let loose on these machines. So they have to be robust, they have to be safe. So we're we you know we're we're putting um, coatings on them that will be make them easy to wipe down and so on and so forth. We're putting vinyls on the side. Um, these sorts of things, it's okay. Um, perhaps if if that not that many people were going to play them, but we expect a lot of people. There's a, there's a lot of interest um, in these little cabinets. Um, specifically, the standalone one uh, seems to be very popular. Um, so let me just do, let me just finish this one off anyway. Um, we'll just put spacey beds on this one. So just going back to what Jim was suggesting. So <clears throat> at the moment, all the other cogs are playing games. Uh, cog zero is in the menu, but if I choose right, so player zero, game zero. Player one is playing Lunar Rescue. Player two is playing Lunar Rescue as well. Player three is playing game five, which is Space Laser. Player four is playing The Maze. Player five is playing Lupin. Player six is playing Bowler. Player seven is Invaders. And play back to zero. So um, another thing that Jim has added, which is really good, is a common high score across all cabinets. So at the moment, we'll see that the score is zero, the high score is zero. 
if I quickly play a game of Space Invaders and create a high score, that won't be difficult. The difficult bit is dying sometimes. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play Space Invaders on the left-hand cabinet. And I don't know if you're going to really make that out, but the score, high score is now 30. So if I now beat that high score on this cabinet, it will be reflected in this cabinet or any of the cabinets that want to play Space Invaders. And I think, Jim, that we've done that for all the games, have we? Yeah, we've done that for all the games that have scores on you. Yeah. Yeah. Back to my main camera. Yeah. So is that high score persistent during power cycling, or is it only there during the when everybody's active? It when when the cabs are active. Yeah. I, I could save them to, um, to flash ram or something. Flash. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things yeah, that we've been that discussing. Yet. So one of the limitations, and it's a limitation of the the memory that we've got within the propeller, although we've. We know how easy it is to get around this um is the size of the samples we've reused the samples from space invaders in the other games so the next part of this is to maybe put the roms into flash jim that's what we we're talking about wasn't it yeah putting the roms in flash and the samples and then just bring them in as we need them for each game so i believe it's 128 megabits isn't it 16 megabytes on the um on the P2H. You're talking about audio samples? Yes. Yeah. Those you could just stream from Flash. The Flash is fast enough to stream them. Yo, yeah, it's it's on interrupts in the uh, in the cog with along with interrupts for the tel uh, TV and interrupts for the joystick and playing the emulator. Although it is only running at 70 megahertz, so yeah, it should be able to. Yeah, that's the other just... thing about this as well. The chip runs cold. You know, it's doing eight different games, emulating the Intel 8080 eight times. The chip isn't even getting warm. Um, chip and Jim did a great job on interleaving all of that code to make everything run in one cog. So we're handling the I.O., generating the video, uh, generating the sound, the game running the emulator all in one cog. I think it's yeah. really a testament to nine the power channels, of the cog. Nine channels of sampled audio on each yeah. cog. But on each cab, so it's what seventy-two um, sample channels. Yep. <laughs> Plus eight CPUs and um, eight display drivers. So that's that's the next stage of this, anyway, is uh, to do that. So a couple of little things I learned during this whole process um, was how to how how good wood is as a as a as a, as a thing for making cabinets out of. One of the things I did with the, um, with the speakers, so this is a, a no glue solution for holding the speakers in. I don't know if you can see on the, the little tabs that I've laser cut into the, into the wood there. Oh yeah. So what we do. Nice, it's a, press fit. It's, a pre it's a press fit. So you press up and press in. <laughs> So when production is finished, I do put a little dab of hot, hot glue on there, but it's, it really is unnecessary. It's only in case one of the, um, one of the cabinets gets dropped. And that's just a nice little, little feature that I found out, you know, yeah, the whole process cool. of doing um, the, 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 the two pieces of, of wood to make the joystick assembly. So this is the, the six button variant that we've got going on currently. It's made up of two pieces of, of ply glued together in one of the uh, jigs that I made. The screws go through the bottom piece into the joystick. So the joystick, once, once it's all glued in, the joystick can't ever be removed. However, the joystick is user serviceable from the bottom. You can change the micro switches and so on. You can change the main shaft. Um, so it is user serviceable as well. So that's the, the next bit. That's the next phase of this. Once I get these eight cabs finished and sent over to Jim, 
um, for the world record attempt. <laughs> Jim, very nice. Can you tell us a bit about the world record attempt? Um, yeah, basically, um, I don't think there's any other microcontroller that has got more than one um, game emulated on it at once, let alone driving a display for each of the emulators as well. So the fact that we've got eight on the uh, P2 is just a testament to how good the chip is. So hats off to your chip. <laughs> well done. <laughs> So I thought, as the um, like the Raspberry Pi gets an awful lot of press and the Parallax P2 doesn't, I thought if we had a world record, which we obviously will have, it should get them some uh, nice free press. If you really wanted, I think you could do 32 video outs at once, but you'd have to do artifact coloring. How would you get the uh, 32? You could maybe do that by just uh, interrupts. running. Let's see. Well, every cause can handle four fast DAT channels. So oh, yeah, true. Yeah. If you could uh, just put the modulated data into the uh, bytes of the LUT. You can stream them out fast enough and then run around behind modifying it or just do kind of page flipping. You can just do artifact oh. colors. If you only move tiles at once, you, you can kind of bake the color carrier into the tiles and um, then you have kind of chunky movement, but you could really fast, um, you could do really fast. That would be a really good technical demo, to be sure. Would, wouldn't it? <laughs> the problem <laughs> is that then amazing. you doing 32 video outputs and then you only have 32 other pins left. So you'd have to have some sort of multiplexer for the inputs. <laughs> now that would be really crazy. Well, <laughs> what you guys made is really good anyway. But... Somebody used to say it's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, we'll get this this record first and then if you want to beat it, that's what records world records are for. And it'll be beaten by a P2, so... Even more press for the P2. Yeah. Yeah, we, look, we, we, me and Jim, we, we both have an affinity towards video games. Um, when I, I first started... See. Yeah, <laughs> as you can see, Jim is a, an industry veteran of the games I, I've, industry. I've got nine cabs in my office. And I'm about Seems to add another 10 when I get the 8 in <laughs> one and two singles. <laughs> you can never have enough arcade cabinets, Jim. I know. No, the we, I got into uh, Parallax. It was must be two thousand and seven now. Yeah. When I was looking for a chip that could do video generation, my background is CCTV, so I was looking for a little handheld unit I could make for the guys, just to to show test patterns and various other things. And I've been using a pick, and those early days of me getting involved with Parallax two thousand seven through to mid. 2010s was really great time and this is like p1 all over again for us yeah what is possible just takes this to the next level uh and it's nice to be part of the early part of the journey if that makes sense because we're just finding out the sort of things that are possible i mean i never thought you know that conversation came out of uh, let's do an 8080 emulator Let's do Space Invaders. Let's do Space Invaders in one cog. Let's do eight instances of Space Invaders. <laughs> Let's have a world record. Yeah. That's how it money. Once Chip gets going, you can't stop him. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's been uh, it's it's been it's been really good to get the, the pleasure back into the thing that keeps me sane and away from real work. Um, so, Chip, I've taken my hat off to you. You've done a great Bro. job with the P2. Great well, job. Well, we all worked on it together. Hey, you're having problem, you said, with COG3 in that video you sent me? Yeah. Do you have access to the code? Could you make a quick program modification and see if it makes a difference? Yep. Okay, let me share my screen really fast, okay? Because I don't know how... You guys have the same code probably, but a little bit different. But let me go, uh, let's see, share screen. 
Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is the program that, does this look familiar to you guys? Jim, yeah, I think yeah. you've worked yeah, yeah. on this, right? Yeah, I've okay. worked on it, yeah. All right, so look down here. Okay, so here we go. I, I added this instruction right here. Yep, after the sub left pin, yeah, okay. Yeah, and that keeps it from going to zero. Now, it might work if you just, uh, who knows, maybe you could just use a compare S right here. I'm not really, I, I, I don't know how this program works. I have to study it again to remember it, but you might just be able to get away with a compare S, you know, for signed right there. But, but one surefire way to solve the problem is just put that right there in. Yeah, right, so it's after the sub. Yeah. And that and stops it's... the thing from running under to zero. So you're yeah. like, right now I have, this thing here. And what was happening was the sample, if I were to press all the buttons, sometimes it would go, see if sample is four or five, it could go below zero. But I don't know if that's the problem, but you know, if, if you were having the thing misread the buttons, it could have, it could look like uh, it wasn't switching modes because it, maybe it was getting some kind of illogical button combination. Well, th this is, What's interesting about this is just change the, the P2 Edge module and the problem goes away. So I didn't know whether it was something related to the IO pin. Um, yeah. I have been using that other P2 Edge module for doing some um, LCD work that we've been working on, something we've been working on with Jim. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not had, a, had any heavy loads on it or anything like that. Um, it was just a a bit strange. I used to have more P2 edges, but I blew them up. So I'm, I'm happy to see the new uh, Revision C has got a, a wider voltage range. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll get you some more of those things. That um, really helped me. But see, if you had a pin that was reading funny on the ADC, it, because everything's a little bit different because of manufacturing, nothing's yeah. exactly the same. So it makes sense that on one module, a certain pin is acting, uh, you know, it's going to have different qualities on the ADC than another uh module same pin yeah that makes sense so just variances in the manufacturing process will lead to things like that yep. yeah and when yeah. we've got when we've got eight instances of the same code running each on separate cogs with different pins there's, there's going to be some variance mm -hmm. so what you're suggesting is that we build some additional code in there to to to, to take that away yeah, to just take stop that one. Pro I don't know if that's what your problem has been, but it might be something like that. Might be it. Yeah. In all in all fairness, I only noticed it yesterday when I was just testing each game on each cog, and then we had um, yeah. What this is this is the other problem that I found on the other P two edge was that the, uh, the 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 video level was just over seemed just seemed to be overdriven. Um. So I'm going to look at that separately. I think uh, probably best just to isolate the board. I've got one of those little, um, one of these little uh, things as well. So I'll, I'll stick it in that and just isolate it from everything else and see if that problem remains. Um, but yeah, it's exciting times again. Oh, just one last thing I want to show as well. So we are getting a vinyl done for the, uh, for the sides of the cabs. This is, this is a blank side. Um, so I've got two options. Ken really wants some colour in there, and I sort of agree with him. But this is the other option. And what I've done here is I've just engraved oh, the design. Yeah. So all I've done, that's just literally engraved into the side. And what I did here was I just filled it with some epoxy resin. So what do you guys think about that as an alternative to just a vinyl print on the side? That looks great. And, you know, you could, you could coat that with some kind of, lacquer or something to kind of seal it so that it wouldn't pick up, you know, finger oils and everything and become dingy looking. Yeah, that's what I've done with this. I've, I have actually, um, I have coated it. It's just, it's just been rubbed down, but it has had a coat of varnish on it. And it does, yeah. it does make it stand out really well. I personally, I like it, but I also agree with Ken saying it really needs a bit of color. So I just wanted to uh, canvas everybody here and see what the thoughts were. Anyway, that's us. I will. I will put uh, when we get the vinyl print, which should be tomorrow. 
I'll put a link to that on the forum so you'll be able to see. Maybe we'll have a little vote or something. But yeah. Can, can you can you color color the individual cogs? Well, this the... Francis, this is just um, this is just burned into the wood, so I can mm -hmm. I can only do slightly different shades. And if you don't, if you can see, there is slightly different shades in there, but I've not. The laser is burning it. Yeah, so I can yeah. do some half tone patterns, but to be honest with you, it doesn't look that good. So we can okay. do half tones. So can you put a decal over just the individual cogs with different colors? Um, yeah, we could do, yeah. That would be possible. Um, I say I've got uh, a couple of pieces at the sign writers at the moment that I should be able to pick up tomorrow, as long as the, the marquees as well. Graham, you could probably use different fill patterns on the insides of the different gears. I mean, that'd be one way to differentiate it. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Although I will say, aren't all cogs the same? I know that they're shown as different sizes on here, but I didn't want to make the cogs that much different, if that makes sense. Even though on the actual, um, you have to excuse me, this is printed in reverse because I've been using this for the marquee. Uh, but you can see we have got cogs at different colors. So I'll have a look at that. I'll look at to. Uh, See if I can change the half tone patterns um, on the laser. I vote for the um, the full vinyl. It, it would make manufacturing so much faster. Well, you say that, but it doesn't really, because no. the porous nature of the bare wood, sticking a vinyl to it is very difficult. So I have to do two or three coats of gloss varnish before the vinyl will, will adhere. Whereas I can get away with maybe two coats doing it this way. Um, yeah. I could. I could. But, yeah, I've done a lot of experimenting with, with the finishes, especially. Um, yeah, he's taking bloody ages. Yes. <laughs> well, real work gets in the way as well, you know. Yeah, I know, yeah. Totally. <laughs> but yeah, well, it's been, been really sorry. enjoyable, this whole process, to be fair. Frank, that's a great idea. Tempest, one of my favorite games. Yeah, Tempest was fun. Yeah, we've got an 8080 emulator. We've got a six uh, a Z80 emulator. I believe someone's done a 6502 emulator on the forums. So probably wouldn't be too hard to get some Tempest game working. Wow. Are the how big are the ROMs for Tempest? Uh I can probably. Oh, I would think they'd be like find out, I suppose. Uh, I threw so many quarters in that machine. I could play that thing for like forty-five minutes on one quarter. Yeah. So I got to the like invisible levels. Wow. Uh, about twenty-six k. So wow. probably twenty-four k. Because some of them would be pallets and stuff. So yeah, not very big. We would need. Let's see. That is a vector game. Yep. You've got a line draw routine, haven't you? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you, you could do uh, some. Do. Yeah, and if you made it anti aliased it could be really nice. Yeah, you could make it anti alias with, like, say, just even, like, two bits per pixel. Yeah, yeah. And you could do it really high res. So, yeah, you could probably do quite a good version. Maybe do Star Wars as well. I used to have a Star Wars game. In my yeah, I used, to, I used to have a sit-down cab in the garage. What was that about never having too many cabinets, Jim? <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> that thing so, that, huge, that, so I'm just about done there, guys. Is there any, any, is there any other questions? Would anybody like to see any more? I like the natural wood approach. I think that's going to be the most practical beyond putting all the vinyl on everything. 
think it maybe, looks good. Maybe the answer is we just do four of each for a bit of variety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think, okay. Jim? Yeah, we could do. Either way, it doesn't it doesn't matter to me. I'm, uh, yeah. Let's see. I tell you what. Let's see what it's like when I get the vinyls back from the uh, from the printer, and uh, we'll we'll see if we can hold a little poll on the on the forum. See what people think. You know, you can get some kind of conformally goopy glue that you could kind of wipe on to take up the diff the, the rough surface on the box. I mean, I kind of imagine that might have been what they did with the original arcade games, kind of a wallpapering approach. You know, because they're dealing with MDF, which wasn't yeah, the MDF, yeah. So they had to do something. They probably had machines that would like roll and squeeze and squeeze it really well and push it on. <laughs> It'd be a lot of handwork to do to each cabinet, but it could be done. Yeah, I'm trying to minimize the amount of work we need to do to each cabinet. Um, laser cutting and laser burning looks pretty decent, I think. Laser burning is by far the easiest because I just put them in, let them go, give them a, give them a coat of lacquer and yep. they're good to go. And they'll be good for fingerprints and wiping down with, you know, COVID um, rules and so on and so forth. But uh yeah, well, we'll see. We maybe we'll do some variety. I think certainly for the um, for the for the standalone cabs that we're going to do, um, we'll probably have um, some vinyl on these because there'll be a lot more finger presses. Um, so we'll we'll probably will do a vinyl print for the for the front panel as well. Um, and like I say, we're we're aiming with those that we'll take the new P two Edge module with RAM. Do a breakout board for that. The um, the boards that we are, uh, if I can just find the screen again, what I'm going to do with it. So these boards are pretty good. Um, they will take, um, if you can see that, they've got a VGA, they've got HDMI, they've got composite video, and there is a source selector on the back. There's even an infrared remote control. They're about £20. I'm sure buying them in bulk, we could get them a lot cheaper. And in fact, Jim, you've got a contact in China now, haven't you? One yep, of your yep. old school friends. Yep. We might help us be able to source uh, components and so on and so forth. But yep. my idea is to do a breakout board for the new P2 Edge. Stick that in one of those cabinets and you've got a little standalone retro arcade machine mm -hmm. that you can make yourself because I'm not going to build them for everybody. I'm just going to make kits. <laughs> One last idea for the cabinets, if you're really looking for a, a high-end look, is acrylic, of course, cuts beautifully. So plexiglass on the laser cutters is quite a bit more expensive than the birch plywood. Yeah. Um, but one, some of the techniques I do with that is you can uh, leave on the cast acrylic the paper, which is kind of sandwiching the acrylic, um, on the top and just do kind of a, a vector etch around the letters of the cogs that, that you want to do. And then just very carefully peel those up off of the, uh, while it's still on the laser bed and you haven't uh, moved it, peel off just the internal parts and then raster down a little bit deeper. So you have a slight bit of an emboss downwards and then just kind of coat with paint or spray paint or something the inside of the, the P2 and the logos. And that's, so you basically have the papers, your stencil and peel it off. That's one way to do it. The other thing I've found is if I've got little tiny things, I'll just use a paint pen or something and not worry about the top layer of a uh, protective paper, just take that off at the very beginning of the, of the cut. And then just, if there's a little bit of, that runs out of the embossed area, when I paint it, you can just use acetone once it dries to, to, to clear that off pretty easily. Um, so acrylic a bit more expensive, but it's nice. It's also easier to wipe down. Um, so it might be uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other in terms of which is more labor uh, than the Baltic birch and the coats of varnish. Well, certainly um, for variety, um, maybe I could make the whole one one whole cabinet out of acrylic. It's it's a bit more delicate. Um, so if yeah. it ever fell off a table, it would definitely shatter. Um, but you can get a uh, three millimeter acrylic. So it doesn't since you've got multiple plies of of cut pieces it just has to be the very last layer so maybe it can be thinner than three millimeters well i've got plenty of three mil acrylic because I've, I've, yeah, I've used that for the um for the marquee so i will have a try at that i like your suggestion Thank worth you. a try neat stuff thanks Sean. Uh, so how's the color quality on these screens? Because I have someone with a relatively similar driver board, like it has the same sort of blue UI and the same sort of remote it would have, but it didn't come with it. Um, and the color quality in these is terrible. 
um, like it crushes all the blacks and whites and uh, there's terrible backlight on the backlight beat on the display and just like plugged in over HDMI directly from known good color thing. It somehow messes it up. I don't know how, how, how these. Yeah, look, it's, uh, it's that old adage. You get what you pay for. Um, the color representation on them isn't fantastic, but do you know what? I'm too busy playing the games to notice. Make the games fun. People won't worry, won't worry about the the uh, the, the color. I mean, kind of like black and white, uh, old arcade games. You can't really do wrong with that. You can't really get black and white except for the bad backlight if that 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 you will notice. But um, it's it's bad when you get actual graphics, uh, like actual drawn graphics. Um, then it will look really bad if the colors are bad. Well, I must admit, use VGA or HDMI. Yeah. Okay. Right. right. Right now, uh, Ada, we're using NTSC for the for the video composite video, so we've got color artifacting and and everything that goes along with that composite video on an LCD screen. It's not great, but it's good enough to be able, for these little fun things. But they are eight hundred by four eighty resolution. Uh, these LCDs are the same exact same model as the Parallax one, albeit the Parallax one only has a HDMI driver board. This has got VGA and composite. I think they're pretty good. Yeah, the color rendition isn't isn't beautiful, um, but they suit the purpose. I think for the black and white, it's certainly enough. But like for the standalone one, you might want to get like a better one because I have one of these parallax screens and they're like terrible. I, at least to me, as someone who's like very who like does actual art and stuff, they like like yeah, I, I cringe. I cringe. Yeah, no, and I, I I'm look. I come from the CCTV background, so I can I know <laughs> I, I I share I share that. Um, but we're not viewing photos on them. It's it's coloured sprites moving around the screen. Um, and it, they're a standard size. And the way that I've made the, um, the carrier for the, uh, the LCD driver, the screen at this moment in time is three millimetres thick. The parallax one is a bit thicker. Um, so all it means is to do is to extend these studs and put longer studs in, and then you can compensate for different depths of screen. So you might be able to get a better LCD to put in it. They all seem to be of a standard size. Um, so there's possibilities there for you. I think the problem is more with the color uh, rendition. It's more the driver board, just having garbage code on it. Yeah. Yeah, they're all, and they're all the same. <laughs> well, not all the same, but the majority are the same. Um, I've had them from different vendors and they're exactly the same board with the same chip on it, all scrubbed out, of course, with a, a Dremel, but uh, all the same design. I think it's um, like a real tech something, something, something chip. It, it is, yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a, it's, and it's the same chip that's on the Parallax driver board as well. If it's just someone broke... could find the data sheet for that. Hmm. <laughs> They're good little boards, to be fair. Um, you get what you pay for. Yeah, somebody's, Frank said about another alternative might be screen printing on the parts. Yeah, but I've, I've never done screen printing and I, I never want to try. I'm not good with paint. It's bad enough with varnish. But uh, yeah, that could be another way to, to finish them. Right now, I just want to get these things out. Jim's been Jim's been badgering me for the last month and a half, really, haven't you, Jim? You're are desperate to get your hands on these caps. Are, <laughs> are we there yet? Well, we are. We're almost there. We are, indeed. Almost. The vinyl's the last piece of it, to be fair. Yeah. Like I say, it's been really fun. Back doing propeller. Parallax projects is 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 great. Back it takes me back to when we first started. Yeah, it's fun programming. You brought the fun back. Day. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I think I actually um, I, I just remembered I have um, I actually messed with these uh, settings on the screen. Now again, the Parallax one they don't come with the remote, so I had to use a wire and touch it to the PCB pads for the buttons. Um, so it was very painful, but I figured out. And what are arguably the ideal settings for these? Um, I have. Hello? 
just gone on mute. Lost your signal, probably, maybe. Or click the wrong button. Nope, it just focused the chat button, I think. Anyways, I've, I figured out the optimal settings for these at one point, I think. Um, well, if, you've, if, you, if you have figured out the optimal settings, perhaps you can share them on the forum. I did, like, um, ages ago. Yeah. Well, you know what it they still are. still isn't good. Sorry, say again. But that was what um, in HDMI, um, with HDMI input, gave the best results. There's it's some weird bug with it not properly detecting if the input signal is limited range or full range, which, um, so it doesn't, it's even worse if you connect it to a PC that's set to full range. But if yeah. you set it connected to the P2 that's always outputting full range, it's fine. I don't know why that happens. What is, I, what I also don't know is if you set the aspect ratio to auto, I think they they have some weird thing where they use the reciprocal of the um, actual aspect ratio. So it's always, so if you set it to auto and feed a 4 free signal over HDMI, it will be weirdly thin and terrible. I must admit, I've got them all set to 16 to 9. Um, but I might have an experiment with that. I know when I've switched it to 4 to 3 in the past, it uh, puts a blue border above and below the, or either side of the, the screen. I think um, you can change the border colour. Yeah. Yes, you can change the border colour, I think, yeah. Just, have a... Just setting 4 free also works, but automatic broken bat. Actually, I was wrong. The display ratio is set to auto. And it seems, well, it's certainly displaying a composite signal very well. Yeah, it might um, work for composite properly. Yeah. Maybe even VGA, but for HDMI, it definitely doesn't work. Or maybe it's just a different version of the firmware on these that isn't quite as buggy. I don't know. Okay, any more questions? If not, uh, we can move uh, to Chip that has an update on floating point. And thank you guys for doing this presentation. And I'm pretty sure Jim is very happy because this probably is helping you move <laughs> faster now <laughs> to the finish line. Yeah, it always helps to give, it, give people a prop, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Coley. Thanks, beggars. No worries. Yeah, guys. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Let's try to figure out what was wrong with that one cog that wasn't working. Yeah. I'll do yeah, that. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, we can we can talk in the next day about that. Okay, Chip. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, guys. That was really cool. Cheers. All, All right. right. So yeah, that's you, Chip. Okay, let me let me go to the uh, let's see here. I'll go to our documentation, right? There. Okay, so now we we'll go to the top of this thing. Uh, Let me see here. Fixed bug. F square root bug in the 35p. There. No need to make a whole new entry. Okay, so uh, I added in the floating point here. This is the latest, um, you know, version I put out. We just searched for floating point. There's 24 hits. So uh, let's see. So I've, I'm just going to go over the changes in the documentation that, that bring up where these things are now. So um, we now have special floating point operators that can treat longs as single precision floats. Uh, let's 
see down at the bottom, there's a little mention of that in the section where we define how to enter in a float number. Um, okay, so the operators, here we go, where you see green, this is the new stuff. So um, I just threw them in here because they, they're just operators and they fit right into the precedent structure of the uh, spin two math operators. So uh, here we have the negate right here. Um, we don't have the thing about the floating point operators is they don't have the automatic assignment potentials where you can put an equal sign after them um, because that would take a lot more code. And I think they're, they're kind of special. So I just, you can do any floating point thing you want, but you can't like add five. You have to say X equals X plus 5.0, or X equals X colon equals X plus dot 5.0. So whenever you want to do anything floating point, you've got to be sure to use the floating point operator. Like um, F abs is the, uh, you know, the, the one that will just clear the MSB for the floating point. Um, if you want to do a negate in your runtime code, even if it's for a constant, you've got to use minus dot. If you use minus, it's going to do a two's complement. Uh, but the minus dot will do the uh, MSB toggle, which will change the, uh, the sign of the floating point value. Uh, there's also this F square root now, which, you know, is the full floating point square root function. It's just called F square root. So what I'll do, I'll probably soon add sine and cosine into spin two for floating point, but we'll probably have like F sine and F cosine and uh, to differentiate them from the, anything else. So let's see, we go down here a little bit. Here's the floating point multiply. Uh-oh, didn't want to do that. There we go. So there's the multiply. Here's the divide. It's just the same operator, but with a, uh, a dot after it, right? Here's the plus or the add. There's the subtract, it's minus dot. And then we have all of our relationals which are just like the others, but they have dots after them because the rules for doing these floating point comparisons, of course, are all different. So we have all the regular uh, relational operators. Um, last one listed is this, it's the greater than, and these return zero or negative one, true or false. They don't return floating point values. I mean, the relational operators, because they're log you're asking a logical question. So it gives you a logical answer. And then at the very end here, we have our float round and trunk. And uh, we have this new one, NAN, which will return true or negative one if it is not a number, meaning it's, uh, you know, if there's something illegal about the way it's encoded, that, that'd be NAN, not a number. All right. So let's see if I uh, go a little further down. So debug can now display floating point values as well as the usual. So here, where you see all this stuff right here, I'll just highlight these boxes, okay? These are the new uh, floating point output commands for the debug thing. So it's still in scientific notation. I haven't made it yet so that it will show 5.0. It's gonna show 5.6 zeros, and then it's gonna say E plus zero, okay? But I can go in later and fix that. I just was wanting to get all this stuff functional. And there's something about the way floating point code, right? When you write floating point code, it never feels all the way right because it's full of, it's like Swiss cheese. It's full of these strange potentials and uh, you can never cover, well, I think we cover for everything, but it never feels right. It's not like writing integer code that you know is just completely solid. Floating point code has all kinds of iffy things going on with it that in the end are all correct, but it just took me forever to feel like it was done. But I went through the code, documented it, it's done. Anyway, here's the stuff of, this is for debug. Let's see, is there anything else below these? No, we're back at the beginning now, let me see. Okay, there are just some Here's the definition of pi. So I think that's it.
Yeah, that was the last bit. So any questions on any of this stuff? You can now, does anyone, does everyone get the idea that you can now put uh, floating point stuff into your code? Let me pull up a little, I'll run our, uh, uh, let's see, why are we not working here? Okay, let me stop sharing for a minute. All right, um, there's a little program included in the uh, distribution file now called floating point demo. And let me, let me share again. There we go. So uh, let's see, this was, this is when I was working on the bug that uh, Francis found. I think this 85 or 86. So here I was just uh, dividing a number by 10. So if you want to do some floating point operations, just remember that you make an assignment by using a decimal point and or an E that specifies floating point constant. And then when you want to do an operation, you can use the normal assignment like this, but all of your operators have to be the floating point types and any constants need to be floating point. So when we run this thing, it, we showed this last week, it runs the number all the way down into the denormalized near zero. Uh, we could say, just keep taking the square root and we could, uh, here starting off with a big number. I think this is gonna get to zero faster. Let's say just 30. Oh, no, I'm still going. So here are your, oh, you're approaching one. Yeah, the thing finally just kind of stabilizes at 1.0. Let's see, let's see So there we go, and when we wind up with one, now we just repeat this. So any questions on this stuff? It's looking great. It's, we, we just have right That's now, cool. you know, negate, absolute, add, subtract, add, subtract, multiply, divide, and square root. But I'll be adding in the transcendentals for circular functions and things. Nice. Hey, does, does anyone have any, let me turn this up a little bit. There we go. Now we've stabilized right here. We've stabilized at 1.0. See, there are some really small below the, the, this, below the apparent digits. There were some non-zero bits and finally it leveled out at 1.0 right here. Do any of you guys have any idea? Um, when I do, I've got to add sine and cosine as first things because we need those for like uh, accelerometers and whatnot. So the, the pain about those functions is we have two pi making a unit circle. So what we need is a modulus of two pi. So I don't, I'm gonna to have to like review um, or does anyone have any, any simple ideas? Anyone done this kind of implementation before where you're looking for the modulus of two pi because that's what's gonna matter, right? When we could do a sine or cosine, we need to take their angle and uh, throw away everything above two pi and leave the modulus of two pi as our input. Does anyone I mean, have the, any? ob the, the obvious one is to just not and just use binary angles as usual, which is just better. I, Wait, I don't think I've ever come across a case that they're actually using radians in a floating point format makes any sense at all. It's just sort of weird math convention that was imported into computer science and it makes no sense. Yeah, yeah I don't like cases. it. I don't like it either, but I know I hate it too. The beautiful thing about the way we did it with the quartic was it just rolls over and those super bits mean nothing and they get ignored, right? So we only have good good data bits. But for this, I know people are gonna say, well. They're going to be taking code and algorithms and things they get from manufacturers that are going to be expecting two pi 
as a unit. But I agree, Ada, I don't like it either, but I, I, I don't know if we can get away from it. What do you say? I'm, I'm confused as to why we can't just convert from what's already built into the P2 to the Cortex and just use some floating point operations to be able to translate it into uh, decimal numbers. Oh, oh, just use like round and... Yeah, I mean, it does, nothing well, in engineering is ever perfect. So it's the accelerometers aren't gonna be accurate to more than a decimal place or two. So it doesn't really have to be perfect in theory. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. If you would divide by two pi, then you get, then the mantissa basically becomes, um, becomes the binary angle, doesn't it? Well, let's see, here's the thing. If we divide by two pi, we're going to get, well, we're, okay, I guess right of the decimal point will be the portion of two pi, right? Yes, somewhere, it's, it will appear somewhere, maybe. Yeah, so maybe, Okay, so I got to figure out though in binary, what does that look like to handle? Um, well, we could maybe arrange it so that in binary, we could just strip off some top bits and then the bits right of the virtual dec decimal point become normalized to two pi, where 1.0, like 0.111111 would be like two pi minus some small amount, right? Yeah, should be. Okay, I, I just gotta, I gotta think about the math. I really, this floating point stuff, I go about 0.1 miles an hour. It's just so painful and it's not fun. Oh yeah, I, I get that, I get that. Not with floating point, but with other things. Like ever tried to compile something someone else wrote and it's like using uh, pretty much any sort of more advanced thing than just putting the file into something. It never works and, and like, I get, I, I like, I, I get depressed the entire day. Not yeah, quite. yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. When we're, yep. I know. I don't even try to do what you just said. And then it like, figure, and then you find out that the stupid build tool um, managed to scan the file system and found the weird stubby uh, Zlib implementation that comes with the 6502C compiler. And it doesn't work because it uh, tries reading that, but it's full of like 6502 isms. Um, so it like explodes. And it's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. Okay. Any more words of encouragement for Chip to be done with this? <laughs> well, or any I did, more questions? I did already yeah. um, copy the new debugger over to uh, Flexbin. So that's the thing. And I'm going to, okay, so now that I have this done, Ada, I'm going to finish putting together that uh, GitHub thing where I put all the files needed to build Peanut. Curry sauce, curry sauce, curry sauce. Now, and I talk about depressing, I wouldn't want to be not me and look at that. So speaking of that, is uh, Jeff going to implement this into the, uh, the Peller tool sometime soon? So we can... I think so, yeah. Okay. Again, to me, just to reiterate, if we just had a flag that, that pops up, if the exponent bits aren't set in a floating point in either of the two terms in a floating point, I think that would, that would really save a lot of headaches without auto casting. So oh, if you right. forgot to say point, 10 point zero and you said 10, it would, it'll just sort of flag saying, hey, wait, there are no exponent bits set. Are you sure you really wanted this to be sure to accidentally use an integer number? Yes. It sounds like a nice, clean way to detect that. Fun. Yeah, we, we discussed this last week. I was trying to think of something that would, would be easy. But it, we were also saying maybe you could toggle it in preferences in case it became annoying. You were really dealing with huge numbers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think that would have captured some of the, some of the mistakes. And then just to reiterate, also we talked about last week, I, I know you're getting sick of this chip, but uh, we do, I, I think on the debug, we would, we would like to avoid forcing people to have to deal with exponent scientific notation. Um, I'm not sure how that would be. Even just having a fixed number of, of decimal points it's you can not set. Hard. Now that I have it kind of put to bed, I can go back into the code. And all I have to do is I have to look at what the power of 10 exponent is. Mm -hmm. And if it's like six or less, then I just, I can tell it to print, you know, so many digits and then insert a decimal point somewhere where it belongs. 
And then it gets a little worse when we go, something is all the way right at the decimal point where we have some leading zeros. That's like another kind of situation, but it, it's not gonna take much code to do. And I think you'd worked this out before on the P1 with your float to string methods. So it, 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 it's it was all in, probably in there. Yeah. Well, in, if we have a high level language to work in, it's easy to do all this stuff. But when you're dealing with assembly and you're trying to not let the code get too out of control. I mean, I found so many things in that code. I kept eliminating instructions because I would do some tests and realize that things were only adjusting one way. So I'd get rid of half the code or that I didn't need to renormalize some number because it would just all kind of take care of itself in the wash, all kinds of subtle stuff. But, but for the debug, isn't that something that you can do in Delphi and have, you know, you just send the 32 bits across the serial and then have the yeah, program that's yeah. running the deep. In theory, over. but I wanted, I wanted it to be able to print out at the low level without needing anything special. So that okay. just using a terminal, you could see some values. Great, okay, neat. All right, but again, thank you for this. I know this has been a major headache and a bummer, um, but it, it's just, it's, it's a necessary evil for most yeah. kind of engineering applications. So this, I think this is gonna work great. Yeah, well, it's there now. And now and remember, we only have add, subtract, multiply, divide, and square root, which is like a little hand calculator, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think that that's 90% of what people need initially, right? I agree. I'm trying to figure out exactly what the Arduinos have because again, that's what we're trying to compete against. But I think I don't think they've got anything more than that. Yeah, I've got a list of things we could add from uh, that someone else did a while back. And again, if you need more uh, capabilities, you could do that through objects and stuff in, in the language. I don't. I, and again, it, I think it's it's great that you put this into the uh, the kind of native language, but it's. Uh, I think all of it can be fixed too. Um, even these trigonomic uh, functions uh, with uh, extra code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can. We can, I mean, I, I was. I had this epiphany the other day that you know, there's all this. We. It's really nice to have this stuff set up so that it works. It works with order of operation where multiplies and divides have precedence over adds and subtracts. But really, that only applies to those four operators. Everything else is some kind of special function with parentheses. And so there is no order of operation for those. They just sort of happen, you know, where they're placed and you can guide them with parentheses and there's no expectation that it be anything more than that. There's nowhere for it to go. So actually by just having add, subtract, multiply and divide with precedence rules and negate, of course, an absolute, I think we've got it like all covered. So people can write out expressions now without any special, you know, funny syntax like how they used to have to do with f add, f sub, f mall, f div. You know, it was very non-intuitive looking. We've got around that problem. Yeah, this will really help a lot in trying to teach things like PID and not have to get lost in those method calls. Um, so I think this is wonderful. Can't wait to work out some demos and test it out. Um, and again, I, I, it, at least from my perspective at the college level, it's important to, to teach, you know, the the pros and cons of floating point in terms of, you know, the, the weird things that can leave you scratching your head. If you're not careful, um, I think that it, it's just, it's something people have to deal with. And, and I remember hearing about posits on a forum a couple months ago, and those seem fascinating, but they're really just not, they haven't caught on yet. They probably will eventually, but it's, I think you're making the right call by sticking with the format that everybody uses. And I think this is really going to add a lot of uh, uh, competitiveness to this chip in the engineering world. Well, it gets us over the big hump, I think. And, I, and I, I don't know who had the idea of just making operators with dots after them, but that was awesome because it afforded a way to like pack it into the language by effectively just making these things. They're still kind of agnostic, you know? It's just, what operator are you going to use? Are you going to do a two, are you going to do a regular binary ad? Or are you going to do a full floating point ad? Just selection of the operator makes a difference without having to get into typing or anything. That's actually really, I thought it was slick the way it worked out. And we have order of precedence. So that's kind of everything. But it will get you if you forget to put the dot after something. Like so so something. again, just have a, have a flag pop up. I don't think it would be that hard. And we mentioned last time that you know, with variables that can change during runtime, that might not be possible. But you can, I think 90% of them will just be people messing up as they type in constants at the beginning. Um, yeah. 
But even if it is a variable at runtime, if it's just checking the exponent bits, it should still be able to, to flag that. But I mean, what that does during runtime is something else. Right. But I think at compile time, if you can just kind of flag and say, you know, this isn't a, probably, this might not be a, a floating point number. Yeah. Chip? Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is useful information, but about 40, 40 years ago, I ran across a book um, that basically showed you how to do some of these things like with the sine and the cosine. Uh, and it, it included tables for some of the series that were used for, I think, arctangent. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll play around for a couple of days um, on the web and see if I can find something like that. But just so you know, that something like that does exist. And you, you might run across it if you, if you think about it. Yeah, it's funny, you know, this stuff got really sorted out when they started making calculators in the early 70s or so. And they're, they, they knew all these numerical things. And now it's all just kind of embedded into chips and it's all taken for granted. And no one, there's not a lot of conversation about how to do it. Well, I, 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 had, I was supposed to write a floating point package for a, a small business computer uh, patterned after uh, uh, the 8080. And, uh, or actually it was this data point machine that was the basis of the, of the 8080. But anyway, uh, that's what I used for a reference when I was doing it, but I don't have copies of any of that stuff anymore. <laughs> but I'll, I'll keep an eye out for, for something like it. Well, I've been through this before myself, you know, 15 years ago, and I just managed to forget just about every shred of it and had to relearn it lately. There's some stuff that's fun to know about, and so I remember it. And the painful stuff, you just like, I don't know, you have to get through it, and then it's okay to forget about it. And then, and then 40, 50 years later, you have a need. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. And hey, Stephen, what someone pointed out is we could just use the cortic and, and go between floats and just, I mean, we know when we look up a number, we can scale it down to, uh, you know, 1.0 and, uh, and use, use the floating point math then to handle it. So it's just really one wrapper around like the two sine or two cosine to <clears throat> this is all very new to me and so i'll look forward i'll be glad to experiment with anything you have um with uh you driving <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, can, I can i'm willing to learn from anybody that wants to help me learn <laughs> absolutely i'm eager All right. Well, we can we can get together and and make a crack at this uh, accelerometer you have. Nice. Yeah, my test environment is kind of wacko. <laughs> How to get semi-repeatable, terribly repeatable testing, but at least playing with all axes and watching the data by using a six-axis arm. <laughs> oh, neat. Okay, I think we are ready to end the discussion recording. Any more questions for the floating point or we move into discussion? Chip, do you think we move on? Yeah, okay, that's fine. So, so we end the presentation at this time.